battle scarred from the comforted of those who grieve from the mountain top to the empty cup from the waiting to those who have received and we cry
reading the, uh, reading the newspaper, watching the news, listening to the news, we are moving up toward the second coming of Christ, the rapture of the church, and you need to be ready. Uh, I was talking to a pastor yesterday that told him, and another pastor said he thought we were in pretty good morally sh shape morally as a nation, and things were better. I want to tell you something, folks. 9-11 will not be the final terrorist attack on this nation. Things are going to get ugly, but we have a refuge. Psalm 46 says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore will not we fear, though the earth be removed and the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. Selah, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. And the next verse, by the way, says there is a river whose streams whereof make glad the city of our God, even the tabernacles of the Most High. And I hear the psalmist saying in Psalm 91, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge, my fortress, my God. In Him will I trust. Surely he will deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror. Say it with me. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night or the arrow that flieth by day, nor the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked, because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, the Most High, thy habitation. Glad he's here with us. 
Call for me Someday when time No more will be I'll say on death Woo! Where is your sting? Shelter me, Lord Underneath your wings Shelter me, Lord Underneath your wings Shelter me, Lord Underneath your wings Hallelujah! If you have your Bibles, if I could talk to you for just a few minutes, here in a little while, we will be anointing our team that will be going to Haiti and believing God for blessings upon them. I'd encourage you in your time of fasting that you remember those on the mission field as they fulfill the Great Commission. But we don't ever want to forget that the biggest and most important and foremost mission field is our own community, our own family our own homes. And so, uh, while God has blessed this church because it has given to missions, I've said this many times and I say it again, the church is blessed here because every time we've had a financial need, we've increased our giving, and by giving more, God has met that need. I want you to know that'll work for you personally as well. Amen? So, Paul said, I'm not t teaching you about giving and uh, into the ministry because God has a need, so to speak. Or, but he says, I'm teaching you about this so you can be blessed. How many know God can't pour in if you don't pour out? No such thing as a, a stingy Christian. It's an oxymoron or some kind of moron. <laughs> Anyhow, I just wanted you to be aware that uh, somebody said, well, I don't understand all this mission stuff. Well, read the book of Acts. Because the book of Acts was all about the command of Jesus that it would begin in Jerusalem, Samaria, Judea, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Amen? And so to set the scene, the Apostle Paul is nearing the end of his many missions trips, and he is on his way to Rome. He is involved in a shipwreck. He warned the captain, the owners of the ship, don't set sail, but the Bible said it was a beautiful day with a warm wind blowing and the sun shining, and they didn't listen. How many's ever gotten a storm because you didn't listen? <laughs> and they headed right out into the eye of this horrific storm that beat the ship into pieces. An angel of the Lord came by in the 27th chapter and told Paul, Paul, don't be afraid. You won't lose one life off this boat you will testify before me, before Caesar, of me in Rome. And how many thank God that he can give you a promise that your life has a purpose and a destiny? And I want you to hear me. If you're a child of God and you're sheltered under his wings, the devil can't take you out of here till you fulfill your destiny. Amen? And then it'll be the Lord. Praise God. So Paul has arrived on this island and they've come to the uh, shores of the island on pieces of wood and boards and fragments of the ship, and every one of them is accounted for. I begin reading in the first verse of the 28th chapter, and when they were escaped, they knew the island was called Melita. And the barbarous people showed us no little kindness, for they kindled a fire and received us every one because of the present rain and because of the cold. And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat, and fastened on his hand. When the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his hands, they said among themselves, No doubt this man is a murderer. Though he has escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffers not to live. 
Howbeit while they looked on when he should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly, after they looked a great while and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. <laughs> That's the way people are. They either want to crucify you or worship you. Can't realize you're just a human and you have faults and failures and love you with your faults. Amen. So I want you to hear this morning this simple sentence, and I'm not going to talk long. You are going to get bit. Amen. Unless you just don't exist on the same planet that I exist on, or you never do anything for God, you're going to get it. You will not go through life without being attacked. Matter of fact, I have noticed that, that every time there's an endeavor to do something good, Somebody takes advantage of it. Amen. How many know when you try to feed the hungry, somebody takes advantage. When you try to help the poor pay their utilities, somebody shows up and tries to take advantage. When you try to give out Christmas dinners or Thanksgiving dinners, somebody wants to take advantage. I had a guy brag to me one time. He said, I already got five Thanksgiving dinners. I have five turkeys in my freezer. I said, you just knocked four other families out of Thanksgiving, bub. And so when you do, when, I'm telling you, sometimes the people you try to help the most appreciate it the least, and they're the ones that'll strike you. I'm just being real. And it's a, it's a ploy of the enemy to stop you from doing good. To stop you from giving, how many's ever given to a ministry and then they sent you so many letters in the mail afterwards, you're like, oh God, I wish I hadn't give. <laughs> Anybody in here been bit when you've tried to help people? I'm going to give you just three points. Number one, the serpent always bites the workers. Paul is building a fire. He's gathering wood. There are people sitting out of church, some of you watching this by TV today, and the reason you don't go to church is because you tried to do good and you got bit. Join the club, buy the t-shirt, whatever it takes. You didn't quit going to Walmart because the clerk was hateful, did you? You still go eat out at restaurants, even though you've gotten a bad meal a time or two, don't you? But oh my goodness, what if people quit going to sporting events for the same reason they quit church? Well, I just didn't like what the coach did. I didn't appreciate the ref. Huh? You're going to get bit when you try to do something for God. When you put forth an effort to help somebody that's needy, to love people, to open your home to somebody, somebody's going to take advantage of you and do you wrong. What are you going to do about it? Amen. You know, the serpent's been striking and biting since the Garden of Eden. Amen. Paul says in six, uh, 1 Corinthians 16, 9, For a great and effectual door is open to me. What comes with every door that God opens for you? There are many adversaries. You can't find a Bible story where somebody hadn't been affected by adversaries when God opened a door for them. Amen? Now watch this. People will strike you like a serpent. What are you going to do about it? Listen to Psalm 140, verse 3. They've sharpened their tongues like a serpent. An adder's poison is under their lips. Ecclesiastes 10, 11. Surely the serpent will bite without enchantment, and a babbler is no better. How many has ever seen these snake charmers? Long as they're playing the tune... That cobra dances. But if they stop playing the tune, the cobra will strike. And a lot of folks are like that even sitting in church. As long as you play their tune and things go their way, they'll just sway and they're happy. But the minute the pastor says something they don't like or, or, or a deacon or an elder or somebody does something that just don't suit them or it isn't their style of music or they don't like that song, they're like... And how many know they can spew their poison? Anybody see any of them spitting vipers? I have, right in church. I told somebody today, I'm going to put a little snake on the dashboard of my car to guard it so nobody will break into it. I'll just call it my windshield viper. That's bad. 
Now, the second point, you're going to get bit, right? If you try to do anything good, somebody's going to take advantage of you. They will. What did, what did Paul do? Secondly, you got to believe the word and keep on working. <laughs> Paul said, shook that snake in the fire. He might have carried it over there himself in the bundle he was carrying. And when it felt the heat of that, uh, flames just jumped up and latched onto him. I mean, sometimes trying to help, you can carry some things around. You know what you'd have done? Look where I got bit. Look how hurt I am. You see what they did to me? And, and if it started getting better, we'd pick at it. So we could say, I was wounded. <laughs> oh, quit looking at me in that tone of voice. I mean, oh, there's some serious pain when the viper strikes. And I'm not making light of that. But I want to tell you something, folks. It is his design to stop you from doing what God has called you to do. And if you give in to that, then he's won. I've known people to say, I, I don't want any more friends. I'm building walls. I don't want to work with people anymore because people just hurt me. Let me tell you something. People have hurt you, but you have hurt people. Amen. Say, so I have, yes. If any man has not offended in word, the same is perfect. Now, how many of you are perfect? Other than Sonia, most of you know you're not. <laughs> amen. I mean, amen, you know you're not perfect. Can you imagine a boxer in the ring? And his enemy just, his opponent just lands a punch that just blacks his eye and knocks him down, but he gets right up and, and he says, I'm not going to fight no more. I got hurt. Huh? Don't use the wounds the enemy inflicts on you, even if they happen inside the church, to keep you from doing what God's called you to do. You know why? This church is not a place for perfect people to get together and talk about how perfect they are. This church, I don't expect people to be all well here any more than I expect everybody up at St. Joseph's to be healthy. What is a hospital for? It's a place where hurting people get help. And hurting people sometimes hurt people. How many believe we need to love each other anyway? I'm, I'm to my last point already. Aren't you glad? <laughs> last point is realize you have an immunity to the serpent's bite. I want to draw your attention to the very first prophecy given about the coming of a Messiah. And it is in the third chapter of the book of Genesis chapter, uh, the third chapter, the 15th verse. And God is speaking and he and he says to the serpent, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. Now that's an interesting concept because how many understand that really there's no such thing as the seed of the woman, the seed is from the man. But there is when it's a virgin birth. Amen? Listen to this. It shall bruise thine head and thou shalt bruise his heel. What literally it says in the Hebrew, that seed of the woman when he comes will crush the head of the serpent, but the serpent will strike and inject his venom, inject his venom into his heel. Now here's a neat thing I found out. If a person finds the right antidote and survives the antivenom, and survives the bite of the serpent, there is then an immunity in their blood from the serpent's bite. That's how some of these snake handlers made it so long. We'll drag those out when you're not expecting. Just kidding. <laughs> Isn't that fascinating? That the blood is so created by God that when it recognizes and destroys an enemy, then it has an immunity the next time that enemy strikes. What am I saying? I'm simply saying this. Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, when he crushed the serpent's head, was bitten by the serpent, but he conquered him at Calvary's cross. 
And now by the blood of Jesus, we have an immunity to the serpent's bite. Hallelujah. He might strike you but it can't kill you. Hallelujah. It might be painful and it might make you feel a little woozy, but there is an immunity because of the finished work of Christ on the cross. We are redeemed and blood bought and we have an immunity to the bite of the serpent because we are washed in his blood and we've had a blood transfusion when we got saved. <laughs> this is better than a flu shot. <laughs> Amen. I have... Praise God, the promise of eternal life. And Satan may attack me, but Jesus said, my sheep that I have are mine. And no one is able to take them out of my hand. You can strike them, Satan, but they're immune to the venom in your blood, in your bite. Amen. When we were building the first sanctuary over here in the 90s, and I was also building onto my house where I was living at the time, I, I was carrying saws and hammers and tools back and forth from one building site to the other, and I was loading up the car, and I saw something coiled up on the porch there, and I thought, didn't pay attention to it till I heard a noise. It was a copperhead. Well, just so happened I had a pile of rock where I was putting in a wood burner, you know, putting it on the wall behind it. I found that rock in a hurry. I took that rock and I just pulverized that snake's head. I smashed his head till it didn't look like a head. But there's something about a snake, he keeps moving after his head's smashed. <laughs> Amen. So I was so proud of Dad, the hero, and I called Tamara and Sarah and Sonia out to the porch. They were all small at the time. And I, I said, look, Dad killed the snake. And Sarah took a stick and touched the snake, and the snake went. <laughs> they about killed each other <laughs> trying to get off that porch. Sonia crawled, climbed on Sarah's back and about flipped her over the rail, and Tamara's trying to beat past all of them. And they're trying to get away from a snake that has a crushed head, not the ability to hurt them, but now they're hurting each other because the snake's still moving. <laughs> Boy, did I get a sermon out of that. You just got it. <laughs> the snake cannot hurt you. You're a child of God. But he's still moving. And when he moves, we sometimes hurt each other. Amen. I just want you to realize this morning that God wants you to be immune or realize your immunity to the bite of the serpent and walk in victory. This following that I'm about to read to you was found written on a wall in Mother Teresa's home for children in Calcutta. And, and if you want, we'll get you copies of this because it just blessed me. Listen to what probably she wrote. People are often unreasonable, irrational, and self-centered. Forgive them anyway. If you are kind, people may accuse you of selfish ulterior motives. Be kind anyway. Amen. If you are successful, you will gain unfaithful friends and genuine enemies. Succeed anyway. What you spend years creating, others could destroy overnight. Create anyway. If you find serenity and happiness, some will be jealous. Be happy anyway. Tell the person next to you, don't worry, be happy. <laughs> the good that you do today will often be forgotten. Do good anyway. Amen. Give the best that you have. It will never be good enough. Give your best anyway. Amen. In the final analysis it is between you and God. It was never between you and them anyway. Amen. Isn't that awesome? Go ahead, give the Lord a hand. <clears throat> Listen to this verse in closing from Colossians 3.23. Whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the greater inherit the reward of inheritance 
for ye serve the Lord Christ. Amen. Praise God.